to probably just be bird hearing uh, with a few complications. And so, so I'll take you uh, first of all on a travel with a sound signal through the avian uh, sound uh, that passes up to the brain, just to see how it all works. So <coughs> we start at, uh, with the outer ear. This is a cormorant that we work with, and the first problem was we couldn't find the ear. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? Well, most uh, people probably wouldn't know that birds have ears, although they can sort of uh, think that they must, uh, they must have, because you don't see them. Ears in birds are covered by special feathers called covers. They have no bar barbs, which means that they are almost like, like down, such that uh, sound can pass or without any obstruction, uh, but, and, and uh, they can keep uh, dust and, 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 and uh, particles out. Um, but often it's difficult to find them. And especially in a diving bird, so now I'm talking to the marine uh, and a <laughs> biologist, a diving bird has a very small opening, slit-like, and so for some birds it's possible for them to, to close the ears when they're diving. Uh, there probably even is a passive uh, uh, closure uh, when they go to, to a very uh, big dips, uh, dips. Here you can see it at a high magnification, uh, <clears throat> and you see uh, other parts here. Uh, <clears throat> so this is one, uh, one feature of the outer ear of, of birds. In, in some birds and so on, it would be placed some two to three uh, uh, eye diameters uh, uh, here, uh, behind the, the eye, but in this particular one, it was up here. So, <clears throat> like us, birds have symmetrical ears. They sing uh, the outer ears on both sides. Uh, but they have, of course, a problem that they're uh, their heads are, are small relative to the wavelengths that they are communicating with. Uh, <clears throat> so you might wonder why they have not developed pinnae like and, and mouths, for instance. But obviously they can get around with it. Though <clears throat> one thing you should, whatever I say here, has to do with sort of a generic ear. Because there's a tremendous variation through the uh, uh, animal uh, through the bird taxa uh, of anything, everything that has to do with with uh, ears, because there are some animals and some birds that have sort of pinnae. That's the specialized owls. <clears throat> they have this facial rough, as it's called, that sort of funnels sound towards the ear openings. Uh, so it, may, it, uh, it uh, makes time differences uh, bigger, uh, such that it's easy to calculate the direction to a sound. Uh, but then there's another feature in these birds. Their ears are not symmetrical. They are not mirror images of each other. So if you look at this long ear to ours, for instance, you have the beak here, you have the beak here, so this is the left ear, this is the right ear. You can see immediately that the anatomy, the geometry of the opening is different. And this uh, allows different uh, spectral components to be generated in the two ears. And because they then both have uh, time differences that are extended because of, of uh, this uh, 11 uh, centimeter wide head, and they have these spectral com uh, components. They are able to, uh, oh, sorry, <coughs> they are able to uh, find the direction to sound uh, uh, not only in this plane but also up and down. Which means that, for instance, a barn owl can sit in absolute darkness up uh, on on perch. And there'll be a mouse, you know, rattling a little bit down here, 
and in absolute darkness, it can find it in centimeter, with centimeter precision. So that's, that's absolutely fantastic. But then you should note that it's not all owls that are like this. There's, they are the specialized owls. There are other owls that are just like normal birds when it comes to hearing. <clears throat> then we have the avian middle ear. So we came up to the outer ear, we went through the meatus, that's the long tunnel, to, uh, to, to the eardrum. And now you know all about this because I, uh, Jakob explained it very, very carefully, but you know that uh, repetition is the core of all pedagogies. So, so I'll just uh, uh, give, you, give, give it to you one more time. So <clears throat> we have bone, we have bone, we have bone, and then we have this middle ear cavity, as it's called. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, we have the eardrum that is sort of pressed out uh, by this arrangement here, just as if you are uh, pitching a tent, put up a stake, and there, there you have it uh, extended. <clears throat> then you have this green stuff, that is a, a cartilaginous uh, bone, uh, that sort of is responsible for extending the tent. And it sits on top of this columella, which, is, which in most birds is also half bone, half uh, car 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 cartilaginous. And it uh, has a foot plate here. So this is a very sneaky, very ingenious uh, uh, arrangement. Because as Jakob said, uh, we have a problem. Out here we have air, in here, uh, in the vestibular system and, and in, in the, uh, 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 the, the bird cochlea, uh, we have period leaf, which is uh, 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 like, like water, very incompressible. So <clears throat> if we did not have this arrangement, <laughs> sounds that impinged on uh, the inner ear would be reflected and nothing would be heard. And <clears throat> because Jakob uh, said that you shouldn't talk about impedance, uh, they, uh, or in, in literature, they use the term impedance <coughs> and impedance matching. And you could imagine that impedance, that is sort of the opposition to longitudinal waves. So in air, there's little opposition. You have a low density, you have a low uh, uh, compressibility, and, and you have a, a low uh, a, a velocity of sound. In any uh, fluid, you have the opposite. You have high, high density, you have low compressibility, and you have a high uh, uh, velocity of sound. So <clears throat> these should be matched. And the only um, uh, we, um, possibility of matching those is to use a lever system. So you can, can imagine uh, Tess would be taking her child out uh, in a few years uh, in the playground, and uh, there could be a seesaw. Put the, the child at one end of the seesaw and put yourself at the other end, the child will never come down. But if you go closer and closer to uh, the fulcrum, it's possible to balance it and you can have a, a fine time. <laughs> <coughs> and this is what is done here actually. Because we have, uh, uh, we, we have this extra columella that can move around a fulcrum here. So when this moves, the uh, uh, the uh, the columella here moves also, but there is a twist to it because this moves the, the most, but this is sort of a, it, uh, 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 so a certain distance away from from uh, the umbo, and it, it is called a, a, a lever of the second order. So instead of uh, thinking about a seesaw, 
you should think about a nut cracker. You can imagine that you are you are, you are, <coughs> you are trying to uh, crack a nut that's here. So if this was out here, uh, it would be difficult to crack the nut. But if it, you move it closer and closer here, uh, the, uh, the the, the uh, ratio of uh, the forces will be increased. So you you know you will not crack it. Uh, if you really want to, to crack, you need to have it as close as possible uh, to the fulcrum. So <clears throat> this is one kind of amplification that you get. There's another kind of amplification, and that's the ratio between the area of the foot plate and the air, the efficient area of the eardrum. Think about uh, there's certainly women here uh, walking in your normal shoes. You, uh, you can walk on this t uh, uh, floor and on any floor uh, without problem. But then put on your high heels on your stilettos, and you should think about whether you're walking on on a wooden floor or this kind of floor, because you you suddenly all your weight is concentrated in just a very small area. So. There, there is an amplification that having to do uh, with the, the difference between this area and that area. So together, these two amplifications, one about the area ratio and the other about where uh, the chronometer the, uh, is placed, give you an amplification, a lever amplification, you could, you could call it, or as it is referred to in literature, an impedance matching <coughs> that amounts to uh, about 30, 30 dB, something like that. Is that sort of clear? Yeah. Yes, I have a little question. Um, uh, Jacob said that uh, any movement causes sound, right? Yes. So with the avian ear, how does the bird isolate that sound as, it, as it's flying in the air? <coughs> um, the sound of its movement in the air, mm -hmm. uh, of the friction or whatever, uh, to sound of prey or something else? <coughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Well, <coughs> part of it, at least, is caused by <coughs> these, these uh, covers that works much in the same way as the uh, wind jammer on, on the microphone. On the, with the, oh, yeah. um, so like, the, like this one that's put on, mm -hmm. such that <coughs> all the air turbulence that makes lots of sound is, is reduced. So, and, and, and the, which means that it, it's possible to, of course, to hear things, but, but uh, uh, you may have been biking down uh, a very steep hill and, and you could hear the the sound rushing away, and it's, it, of course it's diff more difficult to, to, to hear because it's noise. And Jakob will come back to, to noise and what it means, and how your thresholds are increased. Does that answer, answer your question? Okay, <clears throat> so the next step uh, after the middle ear, that's in here, that's the cochlear duct where uh, the sensory cells are. And perhaps I should just point out, we'll come back to this pharyngo tympanic tube, which is an outlet from the in inner ear cavity. But then, <clears throat> the inner ear, uh, Jan pointed out how mammalian ears, uh, inner ears, uh, is, a, uh, is a, a, co uh, a, co a cochlea, like a snail, Whereas here, in birds, it's flat. So, <clears throat> if you see, here we have the oval window. That's where the foot plate of the, the uh, uh, columella excites what is in here. And all the blue stuff is then uh, the perilymph, uh, the, yeah, the fluid in the air. So the oval, uh, the oval window will start to vibrate and pressure waves will then 
pass through here, and there's a pressure release at the, at the round window. And <coughs> recently, uh, Jeff Seil, who was here in Stellenbosch, some of you may have met him or heard about him, uh, found out uh, that when looking at 150 species or something, you find that always, or on average, the round window is three times bigger than the, the oval window. Which means that <coughs> you press here, you press in here, and this one bulges out. So if this is much bigger than that one, that will decrease the uh, impedance of the inner ear. Okay, <coughs> but uh, we have a tube here, and we're looking in at the side. We have the scalar vestibuli uh, above and scalar tympani below. And all the interesting stuff happens here at the cochlear partition. So now I'll sort of cut, make a cut here, and then discuss or, or point out what we see. So <clears throat> we made a cut. This is a tube. And here we have the scalar vestibuli. Here, scalar tympani. And here we have the cochlear partition with all this stuff. So, <clears throat> on top of it, there's uh, this tegmentum, tegmentum vasculare, which uh, are some, some uh, uh, an epithelium with cells that uh, eject a lot of, of, of potassium, such that the uh, potassium concentration in this kind of media is very, very high. Then we have a tectorial membrane, it's just a sort of almost cartilaginous uh, stuff that is running along and covering the, the site where, where things really happen. That is the base of the papilla. That's where all the sensory cells are. And you see, it's anchored in one, uh, in one side up here, like here, and, and up here. And it's all sitting on the base of the membrane. So, <clears throat> If we have uh, um, pressure variations coming in this direction, coming down here, they come up here, and then they work directly on the basilar, uh, on the basilar membrane and the basilar papilla. Then the uh, hair cells are excited. And you can see we have then all the dendrites uh, that uh, synapse with the hair cells uh, the dendrites to the uh, to the cochlea ganglion from where we have the um, auditory nerve uh, to the uh, central nervous system. So it's it's pretty complicated. Uh, did I get the message through? Okay. Uh, so now we looked in here. We took a, a cross-section. <clears throat> now I'm going to cut off this part such that we can look down at the scalar symphony and then I'll also have to uh, rip away the, t the tectorial membrane. <clears throat> and then we see something like this. It, it can be a little bit complicated with uh, the 3D, but I hope you can follow me. This is. This is the butt base of the papilla when we look from here. And what you can see is that it is very pointed in one end. That is where, uh, close to where the oval window and the round window are, and very rounded up here. But then it becomes a bit complicated. <laughs> because uh, when people look into this, they don't find uh, the the, the uh, uh, organized rows and we, uh, like we have in the uh, mammalian inner uh, ear, but we just have one big population of, of hair cells. Some of them <clears throat> in the apical end, they are tall, they respond, for instance, to 50 hertz, and in the other end, we have basal hair cells that respond perhaps to uh, 5 kilohertz. But then across the uh, <coughs> the basilar papilla they also vary. So that we have tall hair cells 
uh, at the neural side and short hair cells at the abnormal side. And then, of course, we have all the uh, uh, ganglion cells and the auditory nerve. Uh, but <clears throat> it's still, I, as I understand it, it's still quite, quite a puzzle of how it works. Um, here we have a slide. You see, this is where we were just looking. If we go to 20 percent, uh, that's about must be about here. Then we'll see that in the apical end, the hairs are, are pretty tall, and there are not so many of them uh, on each hair cell. Whereas in the uh, basal end, uh, the hair cells have many hairs, and they are very short. And, and, and super short and stiff. So uh, the question is how it, it actually works. Uh, um, because uh, the uh, when when you look at, at, uh, at the uh, uh, inner workings of of it, uh, of course. It, I think you, you know from, from mammalians that when uh, these hair cells, their hairs are pushed in one direction, they, the tiplings will open uh, some, some channels, uh, so uh, potassium will, will uh, go into the cell, uh, it will uh, let uh, calcium channels open here, and the cell will, uh, will, will uh, send out transmitter a substance such that it can be uh, that it can elicit uh, nervous signals, uh, action potentials in the uh, in the, the auditory nerve. However, <clears throat> there's a problem because the tall hair cells uh, they are they, they have both uh, afferent and efferent connections. Uh, what does afferent mean? In, uh, in this connection, it means uh, taking signals from the periphery to the central, uh, to the central nervous system. Whereas efferent means going from the central nervous system to the uh, to, to the periphery. And that's a, a strange, strange thing that these uh, uh, tall hair cells they have both afferents, so they can both send. Uh, signals to the brain, <coughs> and they also have efferent, so they can be modulated. Whereas the short hair cells, they only have efferents, so they don't report anything. And uh, and also, <laughs> to, to make things even more complicated, uh, the, uh, the cells are also so-called uh, electrically tuned, which means that they have some preferred uh, frequencies uh, to which they, they, they respond. Uh, so, so it's difficult in a very short time <laughs> to make this uh, uh, logic. But the other thing that you should should uh, pay attention to is the fact that if, for instance, this one uh, responds to 50 kilohertz at, say, 10% uh, distance from the one side, 50 hertz then at at a hundred, uh, then at twenty, uh, it will respond best to to hundred hertz. At thirty to two hundred hertz, at forty to uh, four hundred hertz, at uh, fifty to eight hundred hertz, and so on. So the same piece of membrane will double the frequency, or get one octave higher, as you uh, uh, go cl closer and closer to the tip. So this is this logarithmic uh, distribution of frequency sensitivity. Did you follow me? Okay. See, <clears throat> then we have a problem. We all have a problem. Uh, because, just to, to touch on noise, because if we are, uh, yesterday Lisa and I passed a, a jackhammer and it was just, you know, blowing our ears. 
So if you are very, very far away from a jackhammer, it's in orbit. We, we don't hear it from here. We, if you get closer, you may detect it. So it's not, the effect is not very severe. Closer, a closer distance, it will start to annoy you. You can still function, but it will annoy you. And even closer, it will mask your communication sounds. What does masking mean? Masking is basically when a, um, an ambient sound um, will um, be given in the same sort of frequency band as a communication sound so that it's difficult for the signal to signal and the receiver to hear the sound um, yeah, with the ambient sound. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Uh, and what can you do to, to circumvent that problem? Um, so, um, from what I know from marine mammals, either they will repeat the sound um, a lot so that at least mm -hmm. something comes through, or they will raise their voices. They will raise their voices. And we all will. Yeah. Put, uh, that's a demonstration you can use uh, with students, for instance. You uh, put earphones, uh, you ask them to, to read wearing earphones. And while they are reading, you crank up background noise. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the audience can hear them raising their voices, but you cannot hear the, the noise, and you can switch it down and up and down. It's, it's really, it's, it's working like this. And it's called the lumbar effect. Yeah, and of course, if you come even closer, uh, like if you have been to a rock concert or something like that, you can't hear much the next day. Uh, you, you still have ringing in your ears. So this is called Temp temporary threshold shifts, and Jakob would say much more about that. And of course, if you are very close to the jackhammer for an extended uh, 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 period of time, <coughs> you will damage your ears irreparably. But then, birds can regenerate it, damage cells. Birds are very special when it comes to this. There's no presbycusis in birds. Uh, I mean, my age in birds would he, uh, uh, be able to hear as well as you do. So, so, okay, so, so you're saying at bird's age, they don't lose their hearing? They don't lose their hearing. Are they unique in that, or how does it work in other groups as well? Uh, I'm not aware of other groups where it works. Might work in good deals, but okay. everything else and mammals can regenerate their hair cells. Sorry? Everything else and mammals, except mammals, can regenerate hair cells. Oh. Mm. Should I get bald in birds? What's that? That so was a joke. Don't get bald in birds. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So then, <laughs> Sorry for being too slow. Is there, is there sort of work that went away of research and development to try and, I don't know, like, use that? To oh, well, for, for, for many years now, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, pharmacologists have been trying to, to find out what exactly is the, the secret of birds. Uh, I not followed this this uh, literature at all, so, so I don't know no. how far they've come. The problem is that it's. It, I think that one of the problems is that the mammal, yeah, is such a special mechanical arrangement, right? That it's very probably very difficult post development right. to to stick in an extra hair cell. Um, but I mean that's one thing we have lost by having that very very specialized culture. So uh, a number of years ago, seems like yesterday, but uh, it was more perhaps before you were born, uh, we made uh, such a, uh, an experiment. We stimulated with very intense noise, 120 dB SPL, uh, in the range of two to six kilohertz, where birds hear the best. Uh, for 24 hours. That, that's required permission. <laughs> and uh, we used bodgerigas, quails, canaries, and seabird finches. Uh, and you should be a specialist to see uh, anything here. But this is the basal papilla, the, the uh, basal end, the, uh, sorry, the apical end and the basal end. And here is damage. Believe it. 
and, and you see, so, so we had a large number of birds, so immediately after, some of them were sacrificed, and we could get this scanning electron micro micrograph. And at different uh, uh, times afterwards, uh, but when we arrived at 90 days, everything was back to normal. Except, this is, this is an example from the uh, Zebrafin Basler uh, Pillar, except that for dairy gars and quails, they uh, had a, a permanent uh, hearing loss of uh, 20 dB, whereas Zebrafinses and canaries, they were back. But what did the, was, could you see that on the vessel of Apilla too, in these guys that were where you have a, had a hearing loss? Yeah. So they hadn't regenerated, or, or there was Sorry. something. It, so, <laughs> so the bodies and the quails, right, they had a permanent hearing loss. Yes. But if you looked at the vessel of Apilla, it, 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 it looked back to normal. So it was back to normal. So yeah, was, but, but, but there might be, have been uh, details. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, that's. <laughs> maybe what, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, I know that in a lot of uh, bird studies that, were, that uh, study how song is used to um, sort of establish territories and, mm -hmm. and for mate attraction, mm -hmm. they deafen, or well, in the past, they deafen some of the male birds to, t to test that theory. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that they would never, that eventually that, that theory would regenerate? Uh, it, it depends on how they they did it. Mm -hmm. If they actually uh, uh, destroyed the basal papilla, of course it would never get back. Okay. And I should also say that if the basal papilla is destroyed by say eighty percent, they they won't do anything. Okay. But also for this song learning thing, there's a critical period, right? Yes. So even if you, you they did regenerate the hearing, it, it, what matters is whether they had it during the critical period of song learning, right? Yes. Well, sorry. Sorry. Uh, when you mention destroy the pepper, uh, what kind of damage it makes to the well, cells? Uh, uh, hair cells are destroyed, but each hair cell is surrounded by uh, perhaps six uh, supporting cells. And one of these supporting cells will develop into a new hair cell. That's how it works. The normal way of destroying it is chemical by giving me some antibiotics or so. That, that, that's very, that usually destroys the hair cells. Yeah. Well, <coughs> just to show you, you the remember, remember you promised test to explain the yeah, autogram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is an autogram <laughs> of the four different birds. Um, so you can imagine that. Uh, we have a, a zebra finch, and at one kilohertz, we will present tones to it, and then uh, it depends on what, what, how we are measuring, uh, whether we are measuring from the auditory nerve or uh, ABR or a response or something. But then <clears throat> we start out here very, very low, uh, low amplitude, and then we increase. The sound gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Say, for instance, uh, we are re recording from the uh, from the brain. There's something called the NMMD, uh, and uh, where it's easy to get responses. So, at at a certain uh, time, uh, a certain uh, sound pressure amplitude, when the, when the sound is this strong, we'll start to hear nerve signals. Uh, associated with the stimulus sound. So you say beep, 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 and then it starts to say doo -doo 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 -doo. and then the, uh, uh, the uh, nervous response becomes uh, more and more uh, uh, intense, the higher you go. Then you go to 2 kilohertz, for instance, and you do exactly the same. But then you, you don't have to increase uh, the sound level as much and if you are here at uh, about 3 to 4 kilohertz, you don't increase it very much. They are so sensitive that uh, they can hear 15 uh, dB SPL, but that's in the quiet. And <coughs> that is in a soundproof room, and you never get that. So, so normally, uh, I mean, 
uh, so that the, this audibility curve is somewhat masked. It's, yeah, okay. So it's always sound frequency uh, towards sound intensity, uh, sound pressure, whatever. That, that's that's uh, the two dimensions that we measure. Uh, <coughs> so it means that this is the zebra fish here, it could hardly hear uh, 300 hertz. Or you would have to in, in increase the intensity, uh, the sound pressure level very much. And if you go to uh, 100 hertz, it simply won't respond. Uh, and you can see at the other end here, when you go beyond 8 kilohertz, you, you again have to increase intensity or, or sound pressure level very much. And if you go to 10 kilohertz, it doesn't respond at all. <coughs> so that's why we know that the basilar papilla, uh, where are we, uh, uh, will uh, report frequencies from, say, 50 hertz and up to 5 kilohertz. Is that? I think, sorry, just I'm going to put it in really simple terms. The lower it is on, on the graph there, um, at that frequency, it's the best hearing. Right? That's the so, best hearing. So that's how to read them. So basically, if you're looking on the graph that earlier has got there, and on your x axis, you have frequency, most of those species have got the best hearing between 3 and 4 kilohertz, mm. as far as you yeah. know. Uh, well, well. Well, two to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but between uh, yeah. one to two and four. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so where it goes lower, it's basically the sound. Um, the, the the animal has that better hearing at that frequency. Sure. And then, of course, when we get just to jump back to the owls, they would go something like, something like this. So they are extremely sensitive. Uh, so as Jakob said, uh, having a hearing uh, a threshold of minus 20 uh, dB does not mean that there's something funny about it. It's just uh, 100 times less. Is that then a good predictor of how of the frequency of their calling and their communication? It often is, but as I said, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily be, uh, be a concordance. For instance, uh, uh, hummingbirds, uh, they, they, they hear like these, up to about 10 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. But if you record the, their songs, there are uh, much higher frequencies in the songs, uh, even into the ultrasound. But since they can't hear it, I can't see that you can use it for anything. <laughs> Also, I mean, for, for example, the barn owl, it's using its sensitive hearing to catch prey, right? Uh, and its communication calls are actually more of a frequency than where yeah, it's most sensitive. Mm -hmm. So now we've been to the inner ear and we want to go further on to the auditory brain. And here I won't go into any kind of details. First of all, because Catherine is listening and, and she is the master of the bird brain, mm -hmm. uh, having, uh, you know, mapped out all these different connections. But what I could say is that, so we go from the hair cell here uh, via its, its uh, synapse through the, uh, the uh, cochlear ganglion to the cochlear nucleus in the hindbrain. And there's the first synapse. And all the information goes to that. So, so from the right ear goes to the cochlear nucleus of the, of the right ear. And from the left ear to the cochlear nucleus of the left ear. Mm -hmm. So up to there, they are totally separated. But when we go to higher, uh, to, 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 to higher nuclei, uh, there's binaural information crisscrosses. So, so uh, it's possible for, for, the, for the bird or, uh, all the way up here to uh, to compare and, 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 and process uh, directional information, that is information from the two ears relative to each other, and that is what eventually will give you a direction to where uh, the predator is or whatever. <coughs> and then 
it uh, goes up here to the, to the cerebrum or cerebrum uh, with, uh, in the input area called field L. And then there's complicated uh, feedback to some of the uh, brain areas involved in producing sounds, which of course makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I want to mention is that if you look into uh, somewhat older literature, uh, you will have a totally different uh, nomenclature here. Because people thought differently uh, about the bird brain in the past. You have the, yeah, you have the, the expression bird brain of somebody <laughs> being not very brainy. Uh, but <clears throat> then in 2005, Eric Jarvis and, and colleagues, they defined uh, this green area uh, as much closer to, to, to our uh, cerebral, uh, yeah, to, to our cerebral. And <clears throat> one of the reasons that uh, people had not thought about it like that in the past was when they just uh, compared uh, uh, volumes of brain tissue. But birds' brain <coughs> tissue uh, is packed much denser. There are uh, at least four times as many uh, neurons per, per, per volume unit as in the mammalian brain. And also, we should be too cocky, because mm -hmm. when we go to bees, for instance, their brain uh, neurons are packed even denser. Mm -hmm. So although uh, their brain is just a very, very small <laughs> lump, they can do perform quite mm -hmm. extensive calculations. Mm -hmm. I'm doing for... You're out of time. Out of time, okay. Well, but uh, isn't that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you said that the, the cells in the membrane can both give and receive signals to the brain. Yeah. So giving signals to the brain is hearing, I get that. Yeah. What signals does the ear receive from the brain? <coughs> it's, um, as a general fact, uh, or general, general, uh, yeah. in general, uh, signals from the brain to a, a, a sensory organ would be inhibitory. So they can lower uh, uh, whatever activities. Uh, but uh, but uh, I mean, for instance, the, these short hair cells uh, that only receive uh, some uh, efferent information from the brain, what the heck are they doing? People, people really don't know it yet. But uh, you've heard about also acoustic emissions, haven't you? Uh, that, that's uh, the fact that uh, our ears can work backwards such that if you put a, a sensitive mic from close to the ears, you can actually hear sounds coming out under, under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. These are called also acoustic emissions, and they, that, I mean, that's something different that mm -hmm. I wouldn't go into, but birds can do that also, but it's much, much more soft in birds than it is in, in, in mammals. I would just like to add that in, in mammals, the outer hair cells are getting the only almost all the effort innovation. So the outer hair cell, it is believed that when they're stimulated from the brain, they will sort of contract and make things stiffer and, and dampen the, so it's like that piano where you put the dampers on, so to speak. Um, and, and the emissions in, in mammals are believed to come from the outer hair cells, the mechanical action of the outer hair Yeah, sure. Um, so um, so you know, with masking, I mean, there's noise. Maybe we'll go into a little bit of noise. But can you track where then you start getting stress in the brain, or you know, your blood starts pumping faster? Does it happen across the taxa? It, it does. I don't know if it happens to me. Does it happen to it does. birds and reptiles? It does. It does. Yeah. <coughs> See, uh, studies uh, in that field only started. I don't know. Yeah, a few exactly. years ago, yeah. uh, but, but uh, there have been, uh, especially in, in Germany, um, they have been into that and, and uh, shown how uh, immune response to changes, uh, that uh, you get more <coughs> stress hormones, and uh, I mean, that, that noise really influences your well-being, and not only us, but also birds. Mm. Okay. Um, I was wondering, so with the uh, outer hair the, you, you were saying that sort of how the the um, hair cells are arranged is, is that the, the like the, the sort of pitch perception is sort of logarithmic. Similar, and, and uh, my my perception as well as in humans, we also have a similar kind. Of, uh, and um, 
if, if they were sort of evolved, have evolved independently, what is the benefit of that scale rather than sort of a, a linear kind of, yeah, why is it, why is it not linear? Is, is there sort of a benefit, benefit to that? Um, and I was actually wanted to ask about um, mechanisms of how the, of, 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 of like the resolution, both like frequency resolution and, and like temporal resolution. And like is frequency resolution linked to like the number of actual hair cells that are, are present? Um, and, well, and like the, the, the ability to kind of, um, yeah, the specific time, the, the time differences. Uh, how, how does that, does that work? <laughs> well, that's a bit, really big question. Yeah. <laughs> if you, we were going to answer that. Uh, see, see <clears throat> if you are out there and, and you, you just listen to the background hum and analyze, record it and analyze it, you will see that uh, it, it, uh, if the, this is the, the intensity of it and this is the frequency of it, you will see that at low frequencies there's very much hum and at higher frequencies there's virtually none. So it has been an, uh, an evolutionary advantage to keep all the low frequencies there because that's that's where, where things happen and, and uh, <clears throat> I mean three uh, log falling over uh, anything would have low frequencies in it. Uh, so, so it's not as important to, to, to be able to, to do the high frequencies unless you're a bat or a, a small rodent. So, so, so they have uh, evolved, in, in, I mean, they have smaller hair cells and so, so on, such that they can, can, can process uh, the, the high frequencies. But they still maintain uh, a sensitivity to, to, to low frequencies. Uh, about <coughs> the, the logarithmic, I'm not sure I can, I can answer that question, but it's, it's just it's a, it's a, a, a heritage from our evolutionary past where it uh, yeah, turned out the right uh, or, or yeah, useful. Um, my question is about um, what's the role of the trigeminal nerve or the fascial nerve in our auditory system, like making a parallel with the olfactory system, the trigeminal in rats, for example, if you cut the trigeminal, mm -hmm. they're going to increase metabolism and it is discussed they're going to, the trigem trigeminal cells to don't get attention of all the, the smells you have around, but just a predator, for example. Mm -hmm. So you get used to the normal normal senses. You know, is there something related to the I know the trigeminal is linked to the to the nuclei for the auditory system, but not I don't know how it works or does that know how it works? Do you know <coughs> the role of the facial nerve on, on the auditory system other than the cochlear nerve? I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, how it's integrated. Uh, of course, uh, of course, uh, the birds will use uh, uh, all the sensory information uh, available to them. <coughs> For instance, uh, I will get back to this. Uh, if they, if their ears calculate a bit wrongly where, where somebody is, they of course just uh, change their gaze, and the eyes will then calibrate the ears to to show it that. It, uh, that the sound source is over here. So, so, so I mean, there, there are different uh, feedback loops where, where you mix the senses, but uh, to optimize your perception of the world, uh, both, both in birds and in mouse, of course. <coughs> but uh, I mean, what I just showed you is really a simplified. Uh, A simplified version of it all, <coughs> because uh, in this middle here, not only do, do we have uh, what I showed here, but there are also uh, several uh, strings uh, sort of connected uh, to, to stabilize, stabilize the whole thing, and there also is a, a muscle that tenses the membrane, so that if the bird itself is swinging very loudly, it tenses uh, its uh, uh, its. Uh, uh, eardrum, such that it uh, will not be, be, uh, <coughs> be uh, uh, broken or uh, damaged by, by this 
uh, very high scale. As we, we come back to uh, some some birds that are really being really loved. All right. Okay. I think the last break is at 12:15, isn't it? It's 12:30. We've got 